Welcome to Screw the Stock Market. On this show, we discuss a variety of alternative asset classes, tools to help you unleash your money, a success mindset, and inspiration to see what's possible when we do things differently. Hi there, thank you so much for tuning into the show. You know, we work really hard to create a lot of content that is educational and informative. And we also want to be the best listeners out there. We want to understand what you are interested in, what kind of investor you are, what your objectives are. And so we've created a survey at screwthestockmarket.com slash survey. And there you'll be able to take the quick survey and we'll be in listening. And that'll help us be able to create better content for and and we can engage more about how we can help you achieve your goals. So again, screwthestockmarket.com slash survey. All right, Aziz, so we're looking at an apartment. We thought it would be a good idea for you and me to just record our analysis of this apartment in the interest that it might make some good content. But at the same time, it's just good for us to review like our process and, and how we do it. Yeah, let's um, get into it. So let's do it. So this is a nine unit building in Richmond. It looks a little bit, it's not the most luxurious apartment, but we don't have to live there. And it's still a dignified home. So let's check it out and see what it might be worth. And so usually the, what the first thing I do is I'll just go with everything that the marketing tells us just for the purposes of analysis. Even if I know it's BS, I'm going to put it into our analysis just to see if even their BS adds up. And then after that, we go through another round of it and we can tweak the things that we think are BS and say it's going to be more expensive for us or whatever it might be. And that usually makes the price go down even further. And we always make the assumption that the first price that's given to us is going to be a BS price. Yeah. And we know that, but for the purposes of the, of the analysis, we just go with it. And then we start to tear it apart. I always have this spreadsheet on file. It, it has some of the key things we're going to go to is the rent roll and this uh, net income. Now this is a PDF, so it's not something that we can just import into our spreadsheet, but it is actually. I just recently discovered that we can do that. So that's the first thing we're gonna do. The main tool that we use in our spreadsheet is this syndicated deal analyzer. It's a tool that's for, for sale by Michael Blanc. So if you buy it, tell him we sent you. Hopefully he'll be like, thanks Alex. You're doing good. But here we go. So he has this whole spreadsheet with all these different tabs and it's all interconnected. It has, you can, it's more of like this scenarios tab is more of an input page where you just put in the assumptions. Then there's summaries where it just takes all that and a lot of the other stuff and summarizes it on one page for you. It has this profit and loss statement where you're projecting your profits and losses and your expenses over the course of the time that you're holding it. And it has a bunch of other stuff, but we're not going to get into that. There's the first tab we're going to do is this two minute analysis. And this is just meant to save us time from investing a bunch of time into a deal that we know is not good. So it's just a back of the envelope rule of thumb calculation to get us into a ballpark of what we think this property might be worth. So they say gross potential annual income. And then we go over to our spreadsheet. And we see that right now, all the rents added up together of these nine units. Oh, sorry about that. Let me put it on silent. But all the rents of these units is 7,425. And there seems to be one vacancy. So we'll put that into our spreadsheet. We'll say in this, we'll say 7,425. 7, Plus, um, their average is 928. So we're just going to say 928 for this extra unit. So that's... Mm -hmm. And for reference sake, the rent roll is where all of the rents are documented, the number of units, how much has been paid, how much has not been paid, the general typical off-the-cuff information that you would look at for every unit and the tenants. Absolutely. So this we're going to say is our monthly income, and then we're going to multiply it by 12 because it's annual income. So this is saying that we should be able to get $100,000 maximum if everyone paid the rent and every unit was completely filled the whole year. But then yeah, they for all 12 months for the whole month, for the whole 12 months. And then you subtract economic and physical vacancy. So that's a rule of thumb that we say, hey, 
Some people will move out. Some people will be behind on their rent. And so we subtract a certain percentage and we're left with $90,000. And then this rule of thumb for expenses is 50%. So 50% is going to go towards utilities, towards property management, towards repairs, towards whatever. And that might be a little bit high, but it's actually conservative. It's safe for us to assume that our expenses are going to be high and be pleasantly surprised later when they're lower. Now we're left with $45,000 of net operating income. And then this market cap rate is a little bit more of a complicated thing, but I don't think that in Richmond we're getting a 7% cap rate. I think it might be closer to 5 So let's see what 5 gives us. At a 5% cap rate, and we're at 900000 mm. And can you briefly explain for the audience why <clears throat> you downgraded it to 5 So if you paid cash for the building, if you did, the profit that you'd get is this 5%. Really, it's an indicating indication of risk, of demand. So if there's um, a place in like downtown Times Square, Manhattan, which is one of the hottest, most you know developed areas, you probably get a 2 or 3% cap rate because it's so in demand. But if you got a place that was out in the middle of nowhere and there's no jobs and it's just cornfields and no one lives there, you might be able to get up to a 10 or 12 or 20% cap rate. And those places are, you pay less for the same amount of cash flow that it generates. So buying a place in a place like Manhattan is probably not super profitable because the cap rate is so low. You're going to pay a lot of money and it doesn't generate that much cash flow for it. And a place like Richmond is actually in the 5 or 6% rate range. And this is maybe even, some buildings might be lower. I've seen some of them down to 4% and they get sold. There's people who buy them because they know, hey, Richmond is a good market. It's stable. And I know I'm not going to have any trouble filling it with high quality tenants who pay their rent. And so people want to be in Richmond. So I just picked 5%. We can research that. We can call brokers and ask. We can look at past sales and see what those cap rates have been. But for now, I'm just using this rule of thumb, this kind of, just from our experience, I'm thinking 5%. Yeah. So the lower the and, number, the safer the market. And the more expensive. For and example, yeah, if you put 2%, again, you're still only making $45,000 from it. But let's say if we put 2% in the cap rate, now the same building is worth $2.2 million. And again, if we turn that into a 15%, the same exact building, the same $45,000 of profit are going to be, we're, we're only going to pay $300,000 for it. Because there's more risk. Because there's more risk. You might be in a bad neighborhood with crime or um, something like that. And those are the things that we look at with cap rate. Um, when I first started this, it was very common to look at 8% cap rates. And those are more and more rare these days. So now it's six or seven or five percent. So again, let's just use five for now. And pleasant surprise is that it is going to be worth about nine hundred thousand, which is the asking price. So after this quick analysis, now we know this might be worth spending more time on. So we can go into the next step. If we came back and and we let's say we we knew that this was a lower cap rate. We know that they're asking $875,000 for this property. And if they said, oh, yeah, it's worth $2 million, we wouldn't even waste our time because, hey, that's way off. Chances of negotiating them down more than half of their price is very unlikely. We would just move on. But with this, I think we're in the ballpark. So it is worth going through the more detailed analysis. So let's start that now. No, actually, before that, we have to input some data from our spreadsheet. So this is the cool thing. All right, so again, I just learned this pretty recently, but I think it's really cool and it's a really important tool for us. So we have data. And instead of manually typing in a table like this, where you'd say, okay, suite one, two, three, four, I like how they call it suite, <laughs> but instead of apartment or unit, but it does sound fancier. It I think I'm gonna fancy. Yeah. All right. So instead of manually typing this into our spreadsheet, we can import it. 
So we would go into data, get data from a file, and you can pull it from a PDF. You can pull it from websites. You can pull it from images. So it's really cool. It can save us a lot of time. So let's pull from this PDF. And this part we'll probably edit so that it's just a little bit more because it takes a little bit of time for the Excel to actually go in and read it, read the file. But that's what it's doing now. And it's you can pick on any tab and just input that, and it'll give you a preview. Hey, column one is sales price, 875, number of units. So that's relevant. And then we can actually select multiple items, multiple tables. So we'll put in column two. Let's look at table three. That's a bunch of demographic data, which is useful, but I'm not going to pull it in. Table four is the rent roll. So that's definitely coming. Table five. I don't know what this is. Table six is expenses. We definitely want that. And we can go through the whole thing and just see. I don't know what any of this other stuff is. So it's more demographic stuff. I think that's good enough for me. So let's load all that data. And again, now Excel is going to read all that stuff and get it so that we can just pull it into our spreadsheet. So even if it takes a minute, it's going to save us some time. Go ahead. Normally, Adina. you would look at the demographic stuff that you were glossing over at the beginning before you even get into the market, just to see, is it a growing market? Are people moving there? Is it a younger market where people are going to stay there for a little bit longer? Or is it a dying market? Before you even get to the part of analysis of the deal, you want to do that assessment and analysis of your general market. You don't want to come to an area where people are moving out, jobs are drying up, and most of the population just elderly that are about to keel over any minute. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The market is more important than the deal. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So now we have those um, tables loaded and I'll just pull them all into this worksheet. So we'll go here first and we'll say get data from existing connections. Yeah, here it is. Table two open. I hope this works. Put it there. All right. And then we'll do it again over here. Data from existing connections, table four, open. And this is our rent roll. So I'm gonna label this one, rent roll. And then we'll get expenses. I'll put them over here. Uh, data, get data from existing connections and table six. Expenses. All right. So now we want to start to pull that information into our scenarios. So first thing is we pull the asking price. We can pull it right from there. Sheet one, it was up here, 875. Number of units is sheet one, nine units. Down payment, we would use that from our experience, right? And we would say 20%, 25%. Those are common, especially in bigger buildings. At this size of a smaller building, I, I think we could say 30 or even 35%. But for now, let's just say 30% down. It's what we would need. Obviously, we'd want to talk to lenders and go through this whole process iteratively, right? As we fill it out, then we're going to get more details from each person. Interest only is a really nice thing. It makes your building look better. So you can get loans that have a few years where you're only paying interest. So that means that you can keep more of the cash flow from it. But for now, let's just say zero for that. Um, repairs. We don't actually know the story with this building. Like I looked at, I read through it. There's no pictures of the interior units. Here's the property summary. And it just says that um, 
it doesn't really say anything really. So I don't know if the building, if it needs repairs. I don't know if it's usually a red flag. Yeah, it might be. Yeah. But for now we can still just assume that it doesn't need repairs and get an idea of what the building is worth. Of course, we would want to call the broker and, and go from there. So again, first we did our quick analysis just to see if it's even worth our time to d do a deeper analysis. At this point, we can do this first round of quick analysis of a deeper analysis, but it's still going to be quick. Hopefully it's 20 more minutes of just typing some basic numbers in, and then we'll have another price to see if we're still in that ballpark. At that point, it would be worth it to go down to the bottom and call our friend Newton Carroll, who's a broker, because really aside from, yeah, maybe we'll buy this building. Maybe we won't. But what we really want is the friendship with this guy. We want to build a relationship with him because he's in Richmond. He's, it's his job to know all the people who own real estate in Richmond and know when they're going to sell. And so at that point, he can tip us off. He can give us, we've met, we've heard stories of brokers fighting and really in convincing their seller, hey, give it to these guys. They're good guys. They've been at this. They're serious. They want to do it. And they're going to take good care of your property. And so at that point, it becomes really nice to have a friend like Newton Carroll. So after this first round, I think it would be time to pick up the phone, call him and ask him, hey, what's the story? What kind of numbers are the sellers looking for? Is there any room for negotiation? We'd love to go tour the property. We'd love to get to know you, blah, 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 and start to build that relationship. Okay, so now we're here. Gross potential rent. So we already have that number. So I'm going to pull it from the two minute analysis. Vacancy. Here we put 10% and 15%. I'm going to just copy these numbers down from over here because um, the marketing package, actually, the marketing package says zero, right? It just mm -hmm. says this is what you're getting. So we already know that's not super realistic. We know that some of these people are, move, all of them are set to move out or no, their lease ends this year. Then some of them will move out during the course of the year. Um, oh, and then these are the expenses. So he made $73,000 in rent um, this first year. So we don't know if that is, okay, so that's good. So that's what we're aiming for this effective gross income. So we can try to aim for that. So let's say it's 10,000 here. Oh, this should be negative 10,000 here. And maybe it's going to be more than that. Maybe we say negative 20,000. Now we're at 80 and then we say negative 5,000 here. So we're at 75 and what did he have? 74. That's pretty close. Now explain again what the negative numbers were. So this is the gross potential rent. If every unit was filled and every tenant was paying, that's what he would be making. But in the net income from the entire year of 2023, they only made $73,000 gross. So there's some reason, and it's got to be one of those two. It's either vacancy, those units weren't filled, or they were economic vacancy. It could be a loss to lease. It could be, well, loss to lease is different. It could be bad debt. So tenants who don't pay concessions. If you say, Hey, we need to lower the price to just get people in here. You can have concessions. So it's just whatever reason it is that he didn't get to, to a hundred thousand. He had essentially lost 25,000. And so, so it's either delinquencies, vacancies, or discounts. He made just to fill the units. Yes. Thank you. Good summary. <laughs> and sometimes there's other income, right? If there's like pets or parking or laundry, we can have other types of income. The marketing document didn't mention any of that. So we'll skip that. Now we start to pull from our spreadsheet from the expenses. And again, at this first round, I'm not going to go into detail on every little thing. I'm just going to believe everything they said and put in that bottom line number. Total expenses. 28,557 and 22 cents. So I'll just type that number right in here. 28,557 and 22 cents. Is that the right and number? And that's just because we're doing a quick and dirty overview right now. Later on, 
when we go really into the weeds, we'll go back and populate those numbers with what we think it should realistically be based on yeah. market rates and experience. Yeah. And so when we do these, I, we save them right over and over again. So every time we learn new information about it, we have a new version of it. And so I remember even after going under contract on one of these properties, when we ran it, we had 11 versions of it between going under contract and purchase of the property because every time it's all oh, new information. Now we know that, I don't know, trash removal is going to cost X instead of what we thought. So we update our spreadsheet and it's a little bit more precise every time. So we're essentially getting a range of what we think the pro property might be worth. And every time we update it, we're getting closer and closer to what we think the reality is. And so a lot right of that is just going to be level. research. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's pretty tedious. It can be picking up the phone and calling property managers. It can be getting quotes from like insurance. You have to get a quote from an insurance agent. Hey, this is the property. This is where it's at. They ask you all these questions about it. And yeah. now you can update that. Call, call local trash companies, see how much they charge in that area. Mm -hmm. And then one cool thing too, if you're new, and it, is that a spreadsheet like this, it comes with these rules of thumb on the side. So if you're here, if you're like insurance, it'll just give you a rule of thumb, 7% of the sales price. Boom. And you can type that in for your first round of analysis. But then as you get closer and closer to it, you're going to want to get real quotes, more detail. get more certainty about each of these. Those rules of thumb will not work in the long run, but they get you closer to it. So we're just going to believe the marketing document first. Then when we do this, my version, the next time we're going to use probably those rules of thumb. And if it still works, then we'll pick up the phone, get more of a story from the broker, and then we can start doing more of that research. And it's way beyond this video. So anyways, now we have total expenses, net operating income of $46,000. And now we start making assumptions about our loan. So we already said what our principal is going to be. It's going to be a $600,000 loan. And right now interest rates are, well, we just closed the one in November and that was under 7%, but that was a little bit bigger than this. So let's just say seven, seven point. I don't want to go too bad. I don't want to go too high. If let's use seven for now and hope again, we'll update it and, and, and see, but if it's, if we could get a 7% loan, that would be nice. And since then, interest again, rates you have can, gone down. So I think that's okay. Yeah. And again, you can Google that offline what the current interest rates are. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so what we see here is that our cash flow after debt service is negative $2,000. So every year we're going to pay off this mortgage, which is $48,000 a year. Right here, it's calculated. And we're left with zero dollars for profit for our investors so that's it's a big part a of thing. where it's not a good thing yeah so that's a big part of where the loan can make or break your deal the deal looked pretty good up until then but it's still not over because again this was with all this vacancy right this prob this property had some problem where it was about 25 percent of the income wasn't coming through so that's the story. That's the opportunity here. Where if, if we can buy it and turn it into something that's better. So let's say we get down to 10. 20. Yeah, this is the exact same numbers. Oh, it's even worse here because the expenses went up. So in a marketing document, it's very common for the seller to advertise their expenses as very low. And so we're conservatively pushing it a little bit higher than what they had. Let's see. Actually, no. Yeah, actually, we can look at there. I was curious what their property management fees are. They don't even have it. So right there, we know that we're going to have more expenses than them, right? We don't live in Richmond. I can't manage this property from there. We need a local property manager. That might be... Yeah, they're just not doing it. <coughs> Here's another opportunity to improve the property. They are paying for utilities out of pocket. So 
we could, in theory, we could charge utilities to the tenants and ask them to cover some of that through rubs or something like that. Here's another place where we can explain. Mm -hmm. Explain what rubs are for the audience. I actually don't know what it stands for, but it just means that it's, they're not actually paying the exact utilities, but they're paying towards the utilities. So yeah, I think on the other one that we have there, they're paying a hundred dollars a month towards utilities. A tenant would pay a thousand dollars a month in rent plus a thousand dollars towards their utilities. And they're not actually covering the entire thing. So if they spend more than that towards the utilities, then it's still out of our pocket, but it's at least helping cover the cost. And so, yeah, so the rubs are the additional fees that we charge, like the pet fee, the utilities, the cable, things like that, that's included into the rent. <clears throat> so in this case, we could in theory do that. And that's actually good. And then I just saw this, they're paying for water heater replacement. I guess that's, we can call that repairs and maintenance. We would add that to this right. budget here, which was pretty high, but cause we're not going to be replacing water heaters every year. Right. So that, sh that shouldn't really be here, but there will be repairs. What's, and mm -hmm. what's the average that people should aim for normally for what, for repairs and maintenance the repairs. Yeah. Let's look at the rule of thumb here. There is repairs and maintenance. Here, they just estimated $1,000 per unit. I don't know. 10% of gross income is what they're saying. So that's a rule of thumb. And it, it should vary because if you have a brand new building, it should be lower than if you have a, a big old thing built in like the 1800s or something like that. So that should vary too. But yeah, you can use these rules of thumb and then narrow in on it. All right, so where are we? So we're pulling in this. I don't know. I don't know if this would be enough to stop me from it. One of the other big opportunities is now we see that the financing is what's killing it. What we could do is look into what if we got a 5% interest rate from a seller, right? If the seller was like, okay, I'll sell it to you out of, you could get seller financing and have them give it to us. Now we're making a little bit of money. What is it? Cash flow after and debt service. Mm -hmm. And that's normally the dream is if you can work out a deal with the seller to have them finance the sale to you. And it's doable. You just have to ask. That will help reduce a lot of your, your what you call it, uh, cost of purchasing from the banks in terms of the interest rates sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and what's cool with that is that we've seen people on, on our show, right? We had, we had a guest who did their amortization. I don't know. I don't remember what their interest rate was, but they did their amortization. I think it was over 50 years. And so when you do that, that means that you have to pay the loan off, but instead of over 30 years, you pay it off over 50 years. So that makes your payment get smaller. And now she's making $13,000 after cash, after paying off her debt service instead of seven. That's the beauty so of a, uh, that's the beauty of a seller financing loan because it's just between you and the seller. You can have any terms you guys want. Whereas with a bank, it's a little bit more standardized, more rigorous, a little bit tougher sometimes. Absolutely. So I think I probably would stop here just because I don't want to put too much more time into this if seller financing isn't an option, if without fully understanding the opportunity to be able to grow. So like here we have our version and we say, okay, this is what it's worth today. And sometimes if you're very confident about your numbers, you can get into a deal that looks bad on year one, right? Something like this, where you're only making seven, seven, $7,000 after paying off your debt or even worse, right? Like you're losing two thousand dollars after paying off your debt that's okay as long as you have a clear plan and you're confident about we're going to improve this building we're going to 
we're going to fill it. We're going to charge more for the rent. We're going to do something where now it can make money for us. So it's not but that also could effective. mean you need to pump more money into it, which you have to really evaluate what's your cash situation like. And can you take and accept the risk of potentially having zero income or maybe even having debt that you have to pay off every month with no income to balance it? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a little so, bit more risk. Yeah, it is. And, and I'll say the other property that we had recently was cool because it was in good shape. It was a physically well-kept building. And the only improvement was this kind of stuff right here, right? This uh, vacancy and concessions and loss to lease. So they were charging a very low rent. And we just need to increase that rent to get to where the market currently is. And then the building will be worth more. It'll be a profitable building. But when you include construction and rehab and all that, then the complexity of the project goes up. We need to have more money. So right now we have a zero budget for repairs and zero for operating reserves, which that's definitely not okay. So we would say if it's nine times, I don't know, let's say 40,000 bucks, I think that should be fine. And so these little cells that have these color coding, they give you like a green light if it's like a good assumption. And then some of them will turn red like this, if it's a bad assumption. So they're saying, hey, you're only estimating 37% for your expenses. You might not be being very conservative here. You should be closer to 50% because that is a conservative number or your debt. Cuts. Now, mm -hmm. how did you do that last calculation you just did for the audience? What, the 40,000? Yeah. I just made that up. Just another property that we have. And I'm like, hey, we have 40,000 in that one and I feel safe. I feel like that's enough for that building. And this is a yeah. smaller building. So I just made that up. I didn't calculate it. So that's the part where sometimes experience comes into play. Oh, that's huge in this spreadsheet. Like just if you have the spreadsheet, there's a principle in like computing called garbage in, garbage out. And so if you put, we could turn this number, we could make this deal look amazing if we wanted to. We could just say, okay, we can make a 20% down payment. We can, we can just change things in here, even if it's not realistic, and make it look good. So doing the underwriting in a careful, conservative, realistic way where all of your assumptions are based on something, whether it's your experience or a, a published solid number of here's what rents are in this market. So we haven't even looked at what the market rents are right now. We're just using what they're currently charging. But maybe we look at this market and we say, hey, we could actually be charging, if they're charging 928 average, maybe we could be charging 1,000 or 1,500. And once we get those rents up, then the building will be worth more. But making a, a leap like that, we would want to be based on some good research, some good data. And so that's where you go to different websites or different resources and actually pull those numbers. I think one of the first places I would go is again calling our friend mr carroll and asking him hey can you send me some other apartments in in that area and what they're charging so that i could feel comfortable with these rents or and what we plan on charging and he might he should give us some real published data from there, there's a few apartment data sources like costar and i think yardly or something something like that, Yardy. So there's like a few different websites that are just dedicated to providing real estate brokers and real estate investors good, solid information. Getting access to that data is super expensive. So usually the best way to do it is to call the brokers because they pay for it and then they would share that data with us. Another way of going about it too is you can call different property management companies, pretend like you're shopping around for somebody for one of your properties. And then while you're talking to them, just go like, hey, just get an idea. What are the average rents that you're seeing in those areas so that we can have some sort of idea for our new property? And they'll gladly tell you from their experience for all the properties that they're managing, how much the average rents they're seeing are, and uh, if what you're thinking about charging is realistic or not. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we just so actually just did that recently with one of our current property managers, just to get an idea whether our current rates were realistic or not. Yeah, and I think 
the cool thing about that is it's not just sitting on a website looking at data. Like I think walking, actually acting like one of the cool things we'll do later on in the process is to go to the city and act like we're renters and be like, hey, I want to rent a place and just go and walk around and actually get a feel for the competition and say, hey, this one's charging more than us, but it's like way nicer than our building. So I don't think we can charge that same much. We probably should charge a little bit less than them and actually get a feel of the neighborhood and the market and all that stuff. That's if you can travel there. If you're long distance, like we are for our, some for a lot, actually a lot of our properties, you have to rely on those property managers and brokers to give you that info. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why I'm excited about getting into Richmond is that it's just two hours away. It, it actually will be doable to 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 do it. I think we're done for now. It's not looking so good, but there might be an opportunity here that we need to better understand the story and the opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I think we're ready to pick up the phone and call. I'm like, hey, it seems a little bit overpriced, Mr. Yeah. Carroll, but I like it. A lot overpriced. <laughs> Again, like it's about the interest rate. So that might be another one. Hey, what interest rates are you seeing? Right. Um, again, we closed on that one a little while ago. We got just under 7%. My understanding is that rates have gone down a little bit. So let's see what happens if we get to 6.75. Yeah, still not so good. <laughs> but yeah. And then the other issue too is that refinancing, you have to factor in for that. That's why you also have to do some conservative rates. So let's say you have, for example, investors, and you're promising to refinance at a certain point to pay off the investors. If rates have gone up, that can screw you significantly. So you should be a little bit more conservative with your rate estimates. Yeah, so we have, let's see, we have this summary. Up. This worksheet has this tab called exit strategy. And one of the things I try to do, if at all possible, is to not build in a cash out refinance because it often makes the deal look better than it is. In this case, it won't even do that because the property isn't cash flowing right now. But for example, okay, so anyways, the point is the projection right now is just selling after year five. So the idea is we improve the property for five years and then we sell. And then that's it. Like we've made the property worth more. We sell, we make our money and we can go and repeat the process somewhere. Yeah. The refinance option only applies if you're trying to hold on to the property and just pay off the investors. Mm -hmm. If you're planning on selling it, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. But I think one thing we haven't really looked at right now is the profit and loss. So this, we have these rent escalation numbers and expense escalation numbers. So as our rents increase gradually over the five year hold, we're eventually going to get to $1,005 uh, per unit. But you see here in five years, we're not going to be at 20% vacancy and 5% loss to lease. We should be managing it and taking care of the property so that we get down to 5% vacancy. And at that point, the, the property should look very different. So let's just tweak these numbers and see, I think if it's at 20,000 here, let's say it's 15,000, uh, let's say it's 10,000. And this one will say it's 1,000. Wait a second, I think I messed those up. I'm gonna just do them here, I'm gonna say, 15% and 2%. And then the year after that, I'm going to say 10%. And the year after that, I'm going to say 5%. And then that's probably pretty stable. That's where we'll be at the end. So now at the end, we're making, we're essentially breaking even. So it's better than before. But the point is, you got to build that profit into the building. If we're at 20%, let's say we really go crazy and improve it in one year. Now at the end of the year, we're making, we went from negative 7,000 to making 11,000. And by the end of it, we're making 15,000. 
And so now we might be able to, yeah, it's still pretty miserable returns, <laughs> but we're yeah. making at least a little bit of profit, right? So we got to figure that out in, in our spreadsheet. But again, at this point, I'd be ready to pick up the phone and call the broker and ask him, hey, what's the story with this property? We're pretty interested in it, but the numbers aren't quite working out the way as I'm calculating it. Can you, what's the opportunity here? What's the, and if he tells you, hey, yeah, like the rents right now are averaging 900, but in the market, they can get up to 1500. So then, oh, okay. So now we would push these rents more quickly. We'd say maybe 1,200 the next year and 1,300 the year after that and 1,400 the year after that, 1,500 the year after that. Now we're caught up with the market and where the, the building should be. And now we're making and some serious money, right? We're making $65,000 a year. And our exit strategy shows, look at that. Those two squares light up in green. We're making a ton. And, and I just made those numbers up. They're not necessarily realistic. But the point is, if there's an opportunity and we really believe it, we wouldn't want to pass this up because Again, we're buying these buildings. We're buying buildings that have problems and trying to fix those problems so that they're better. And so if we do that, we should win. We should be okay. And you should also be careful in terms of when you're increasing those rates. You don't want to be overly aggressive. If you're too aggressive, you could lose your current tenants. And then you're in a worse situation than you started off with. So fill it out and just slowly up those rents to catch up to what the market rate is. If they tell you rates are 1500 and we're charging only 900 right now, you can't by the next year all of a sudden, oh yeah, I'm going to jump it all the way up to 1500 by next year. It doesn't work like that. You will have no tenants and then you'll have some lean time while you're trying to fill it again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So anyways, I hope for whoever was watching, I hope you find that to be a, a useful um, analysis of how we go about looking at these buildings. And again, garbage in, garbage out. So really everything that we put in here, we would want to be double sure about it. We'd want to make sure we're on some real reliable data to be able to put this information into it. But for a first round through, we are skeptical and we probably won't end up buying this one, but hopefully we will. Yeah. Hopefully we'll find a way. Right. I'm very skeptical, but you're the optimist. <laughs> no, it's not about that. Again, we, we got to see the story. We got to figure it out. But yeah, yeah, yeah. you got to dig in more into the numbers. It's, it's a process. Okay, that's a wrap. 